Hello and welcome to the We Need Water podcast. I'm Michael Brent, the Water Resources Manager for Cascade Water Alliance in King County, Washington. Cascade is a municipal water supplier providing drinking water to more than 380,000 residents. Today we're going to discuss an important trend, which is removing grass from the landscape in favor of plants that require less water and maintenance. And our guest today is Marianne Benetti. Marianne is well known in the Pacific Northwest. She's an author, columnist, and influencer. Marianne has a horticultural degree from Washington State University and is a highly sought after speaker on gardening. Welcome, Marianne. Hey, thank you, Michael. That's, that's a warm welcome, and I'm so excited about your topic today. Yes, well, I'm glad you're here. So let's just jump right into it. What is the problem with grass? Uh, I, I actually love looking at grass. It's great for kids to play on. But grass is not natural in the Pacific Northwest um, in that it needs a lot of maintenance, water, and fertilizer to keep it green the way everybody wants it to look. Okay. So basically that's it. Um, it seems that with the kinds of summers we're having now, the, the problem uh, is, is being exacerbated. Oh, definitely, definitely. It used, um, you know, letting a lawn go golden is still totally fine here in the Pacific Northwest. That means, you know, stop watering when it becomes obvious that, you know, constant water is needed to keep your lawn green, usually around, you know, the end of July. Mm-hmm. Let it just go golden br- or brown and dry, and it will come back. But we love to enjoy our outdoors in the summer yes. and, and um, you know, you don't need as much turf as a lot of people want to have around their homes. I understand maybe for kids and pets, a little patch of grass, but it's so easy to start shrinking the lawn, cutting back on your fertilizer, your watering, your mowing, your trimming, the collecting of the clippings, all that work. Right. Um, it's really easy to gradually, you know, start cutting out the turf. So I remember uh, growing up, and uh, taking care of the lawn was a huge chore. We had a we had a big lawn at the house where I grew up, and in yeah. the summertime, it was it was something we never questioned. And uh, so much time and effort uh, went into taking care of that lawn. And I can't imagine the carbon footprint associated with running oh. the lawnmower and weed eater and all of that. And the noise, yeah. And the, the other thing we forget is. If you get rid of the so much grass, so imagine when you were growing up, instead of having so much lawn, you had trails through, mm-hmm. you know, vegetation, a lot of the native vegetation. Because we are in Western Washington, you can have, you know, tall fir trees, or you can plant Japanese maples. You can have salal. You can have native ground covers. You can have all sorts of amazingly beautiful plants. Add trails through it. Great way for kids to explore mm-hmm. nature, and then. My goodness, the butterflies, the birds, the wildlife, which is so much more enjoyable, especially for kids, than just having all this lawn to take care of. I, I often come across the term a biological desert, and yeah. I, I think that's what you're you're talking about yeah, yeah, when you have yeah. that monoculture yeah. oh, yes. of grass. Mono, nature abhors monoculture, and we see this over and over. Nature wants diversity. Nature wants, um, you know, all of the the pollinators. And I just don't mean butterflies that are beautiful. I mean, bees, wasps, um, beetles, gnats, all these things that fly about, they all need different kinds of plant material. So it's really, really fun to, you know, keep adding new and different plants and see what survives. And then Mm -hmm. it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And because we live where we live, you can have a gorgeous garden without additional water and fertilizer. You really can. Well, let's get into some of those specifics then. What are some better alternatives to traditional uh, grass uh, lawns and, and it, why are they better? First of all, it all depends on where the lawn is. If you have, what I like to tell people is look where your lawn is struggling first. A lot of people, it's in the shade, it's under trees or the north side of the house. That's a great place to start. Okay, the lawn is is always kind of mossy, weedy, you know, not attractive. That's the place 
that you put in shade loving ground covers that are low if you want that nice tidy look you know using things like ajuga uh pachysandra um the native solals um crane's bill geraniums and doesn't have to be all the same plant you can mix it up another place that lawns don't do well let's say uh the end of your lawn it kind of slopes and it's in the sun Mm -hmm. Well, this area, the water runs off. The lawn's always brown. Say, aha, stop fighting Mother Nature. Take out that part of the turf. Put in boulders. No one's ever killed a good rock. Three big boulders, kind of papa, mama, and baby. Surround that with fist-sized rocks and then maybe some, you know, gravel. And you can be artistic, but just having a bit of stone in an area where that is so dry or so sloped that nothing really wants to grow is a great way to, you know, add a little bit of um, uh, rock is also biodiverse because it gives places for a lot of our cold-blooded reptiles need rocks to kind of bask on. And it kind of breaks up the space of a lot of plant material to the eye. So don't overlook using rock. But um, what I like to do is people tell me their conditions and I'll tell them what kind of a plant would like to grow there instead of a lawn. So, Mike, you tell me some conditions in your yard, and I'll tell you what wants to grow there instead of a lot. Well, uh, in my in my neighborhood, I, I'll tell you this: we have uh, the street and the sidewalk, and then in between those two, we oh, have yeah. this narrow uh, pathway, oh, yes. which they insist on keeping that in grass. And in the summertime, it just it gets so hot. Um, the amount of very, water they put on that is insane. Yeah. And and we call those hell strips. <laughs> and uh, and and because it's it's so hard for anything to grow there, but there are plants that love it there, and a lot of low growing sedums and succulents do very well there, hmm. um, and you can walk on. One of the best that I like are the members of the thyme family, T H Y M E, as in thyme. Okay. And um, there's it's not just the herbal thyme that you're thinking of that grows up. There's low growing thymes, and they do best when you put down a layer of gravel. And then you plant in the gravel. And by mean gravel, I mean like the sharp driveway gravel with the mm -hmm. fines in it. Fines mm -hmm. is like that dusty stuff. Because thyme in the Pacific Northwest and Western Washington tends to rot in the winter. It's a Mediterranean plant. But when you plant it right into gravel, it thrives. It keeps the weeds out. It's nice and low. It's very appealing to people. Um, but then Sedum Autumn Joy is a perennial plant that gets two or three feet tall, kind of shrubby. That okay. does great in the hell strips as well. Uh, so I think just realizing that you have an alternative to ugly brown patches of grass in those hell strips, um, you know, it's, it's a, just an excellent way for people to have fun with designing mm -hmm. and then and see how the whole neighborhood changes when you start to do that. I know when you when you first put in any new plant, it it takes some time for it to to get established and yeah. needs some water and so forth. But but uh, over time, after a few years of that, how would the water and fertilizer needs of grass compare with some of those other plants? Oh, in 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 my garden in uh, Enumclaw, Washington, which is kind of near the Cascade, you know, foothill mountains. Mm -hmm. I think our summers are warmer, our winters are colder than, you know, people closer to Puget Sound. Um, my ground covers in my lawn substitutes, I have zero additional water. So to keep a lawn green, you need about, you know, more than an inch of water a week, especially in the mm -hmm. summer. Right. So you are totally eliminating having to water these areas that are planted with, you know, the right plant in the right place. So you, you're not even though, hand watering. No, I do yeah. not. I have two acres. And so, you know, the hose doesn't reach basically. So plants like lavender, which does fantastic with no additional water. The number one way to kill lavender plants is to water them, by the way, in Western mm -hmm. Washington. I water them when they're first planted and then that's it. Um, lavender and Cedar Madam Joy and Cedum Angelina, and um, so many of our natives, the huckleberry, the salal, the sword ferns, all you have to do, Mike, is look out in, into the woods. Nobody waters the woods right. in western Washington, and it is lush and green. So now uh, yeah. we got to talk about 
the real issue, which is soil prep and what was growing there before. Yes, excellent. Because I want to talk about how do we get how do we get started with this? Uh, if, okay, if a person is sold on the idea, do not dig up and throw away your turf. First of all, okay, your turf that you have is full of organic matter. What the soil needs is organic matter. Organic matter is things that were living that now are dead, and it holds moisture and holds nutrients in the soil. So the first thing that you do, so let's say you have a spot under a tree, and it, the lawn never looks great. And you're thinking, you know, it's easy to take out maybe four or five feet of lawn right there. You want to start small. I would cover the lawn right now with cardboard. Cardboard is going to block out the sunlight. And on top of the cardboard, you put wood chips. If you happen to have compost, even better. If you happen, And then you, you need a couple boulders maybe or rocks to keep the cardboard mm -hmm. weighted down. But you're basically smothering the lawn with the cardboard. In fact, instead of cardboard, if you want to plant right away the first year, use newspaper. Mm -hmm. Newspaper about, you know, 10 to 15 pages thick. I wet down the newspaper first. Then I lay the newspaper on top of the grass or the weeds. And then put down the wood chips or the compost or, you know, Moodoo, compost dairy maneuver, it's even bark. If you want to look mm. neat and tidy at all times, a beautiful dark, uh, you know, bark, beauty bark. So that what you see is not a bunch of newspaper on the lawn. What you see is just lovely beauty bark mulch. Mm -hmm. Now, when spring comes, the grass is not going to be dead yet. It usually takes about nine months, but you can still start planting. So go to the nursery and I, or ask somebody who has um, a lot of ground cover plants. I give away ground covers free all the time when people come to visit my garden. That way I don't have to keep them in check. It's a devious way to get them to do the work. And then you take the sections of ground cover, scrape aside the bark, just in that one little section. If you can still see the newspaper, you can just use a screwdriver or trowel, poke through it mm -hmm. underneath. The lawn will be rotted, loosen it up, plant your ground cover, and then shove that mulch all around the ground cover so the grass has no sunlight. Hmm. That's a really uh, important that's a really important point you're making because I've seen um, other uh, guides to this and they talk about uh, using a sod remover. This heavy duty uh, device, yeah, to to cut the sod and remove it. Yes. And I always think, boy, that looks like a lot of work. It is, and sod is heavy. Now, there have been times where we need a quick, instant fix. Where um, I have myself dug up the sod, rolled it into rolls, but then I go stack it someplace where I want to have a raised bed or a burn. If you turn the sod upside down. And you only need to wait about, oh, I would say three or four months. You have soil to plant in that mm. plants love because it's just, it's composted roots and grass blades and weeds are mixed in there. It doesn't matter. So uh, you never let the sod leave your property. It's very valuable whether you've just dug it up or whether it's in the ground, it's full of organic matter. So um, I just think people could start small. You don't need to hire a big landscaping firm to do all the work. If you just set out a plan for yourself, you know, every year you're going to take out 10 feet of, of turf and you just start wherever it's, you know, wherever your lawn is ugly. Hmm. In fact, I, uh, one case, um, a family had this right, right in the middle of their lawn. They could not keep that grass green. It was always brown and mushrooms came up. That told me when I see mushrooms, oh, there's probably underneath there buried a stump or a piece of building material. Something underneath there is rotting and the grass is not going to grow well. So what they did is they simply dug up the turf from around the, all the edges of the lawn, turned that turf upside down and put it in that ugly spot. They built a berm and in that berm, they added a Japanese maple, one of my favorite trees for the Pacific Northwest. You know, they love our climate. And surrounded that with some Cranesville geraniums, 
uh, which are, it's just a ground cover that adjusts to sun or shade and keeps out the weeds. And so they had an island of something beautiful that the birds could use, the insects could use, wildlife could use, instead of a brown spot in their lawn, they were always trying to water. So easy way to start. Well, what what should someone expect after they've replaced the the grass? Uh, how do the maintenance needs differ? Oh uh, well, you you I think you hit on it, Mike, because I think you know that first year is not going to be easy. It is not a miracle cure that oh you're done. That first year the plants are not established. You still are going to need to water them if the soil gets very dry um, because the roots aren't spread out yet, and you're going to have to weed. Because until the ground covers or those plants fill in, weed seeds will blow in from above. Mm -hmm. Also, sometimes really aggressive weeds, like let's say you had a horsetail or dandelions with a deep tap, they could work their way through the newspaper and the mulch and poke the little heads up. They're mm -hmm. weak, but, the, but they make it. You got to get in there. And hand weeding is the best because you can get down there and get the roots. So I really think. A lot of people talk about yoga classes and meditation and all these things for their mental health. Weeding is the number one thing for your mental health. It's a combination of yoga, meditation. You see the results of your effort. People could learn to enjoy hand weeding. Oh, my gosh. how What a peaceful world we would have, huh? Well, th what I so enjoy about that kind of work is you can immediately see the results of oh, yeah. your actions. Uh, you come out yeah. and an hour later, uh, a, yeah. a spot in your lawn looks so much better. It's really gratifying. Yes. Oh, yes. I have a great story about that. Um, a lot of people think they're getting too old or they're not flexible or it hurts their back. Um, being on your hands and knees is actually something that well, a lot of physical therapists recommend, you know, if you're recovering mm -hmm. from a stroke and stuff. But also, you don't need to be on your hands and knees. Uh, one of my neighbors, um, you know, lived in a wheelchair. Uh, she had um, a, a childhood disease. She would garden by her husband would lay down a tarp and she would lay on her belly and roll to the garden beds and on her stomach, pull the weeds and plant the flowers. And she would have music on and the sun would be shining. And it, when you're close to the earth like that, it's so good for your brain because of the you know, the natural bacteria that's getting into your brain and, and making you feel good. So, you know, the, I just think there's no excuse not to try it. Just try learning how to enjoy hand weeding. So I have wonderful like that, one. <laughs> that's a wonderful story. My, my wife's uh, father was a farmer. And mm -hmm. his name was Frank, and I uh, had a, a dairy farm and also grew some crops and uh, worked like a farmer, <laughs> a farmer yes. of old. Uh, you know, every every day there was there was work to do. I, I can't imagine what his work weeks were like, probably, you know, 70 hours or something oh, like that. Yes. But um, he would, uh, in the little spare time he had in the evening, often sit on the front porch and just look out over his uh, farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that brought him great enjoyment, just seeing the results of all of his labor. And so even uh, to, to this day, my wife and I, if we, if we do some work outside, when we finish, we always talk about, well, now we're going to have our Frank moment. Oh, <laughs> how just, cool. Yeah, we just sit and we just yeah. look because you, you can see the changes you've made and you, you know mm -hmm. that you've, you've done something good. It's really yeah, What a great, we pleasant. have to, you know, as gardeners, we all have to remember to do that. Somebody said to me once, because I have a lot of different areas in my garden, different benches, different colored benches to match the color themes in the garden. Somebody says, so how often do you sit in those benches? And I'm like, oh, guilty. I need to take time and sit in those benches once in a while and enjoy this garden. So yes. that's a right. great, uh, that's a great tip, especially right after you're done weeding. Mm -hmm. Feels real good. So, yeah. Well, just to, to recap on this, um, if someone wants to start out, they, they need a plan like with anything you need to uh, formulate some sort of a plan and start small. That's mm -hmm. important, right? Start, start yes. very small. Uh, we're not going to work ourselves to death trying to dig up all this turf 
we're going to smother it in the the manner you described. And then carefully start choosing the the plants you want to replace uh, and and put them in. And uh, just understand that for especially the first uh, couple of seasons, you're going to have you're, you're still going to have plenty of work to do with the weeding yes. and the maintenance. But less than a lawn. Less than, less a, than lawn, a lawn, definitely. Yes. Well, and I uh, do know young couples that have replaced their lawn and spent zero dollars. Because the newspaper, you can get free um, wood chips from Chip Drop. I get, which is a, uh, you know, about Chip Drop. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then free plants put the word out. Anybody with ground cover plants will give them to you for free. And so you can do this spending zero dollars or you can, some of your classes, Mike, that you guys offer are, you know, you've had such great speakers teaching about, you know, the right plant, the right place and everything. Um, Or you can do, you know, a master gorgeous plan and then every year, you know, add to it. And it's just so much more fun to grow really cool, unusual, new, fragrant plants, edible plants, plants with texture than it is to mow and edge a lawn every week. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I know that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I've done enough lawn mowing in my life. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned chip drop. Um, are there, there are other resources that would be helpful for folks who um, wanted yes. to give this well, a try? Well, I live, and then I also think on the east side where they still have uh, dairy farms. The dairy farmers um, are really trying to be good stewards of the land and getting rid of their manures. Other than spreading too much manure, believe it or not, too much manure is not good for our salmon or our lawns because Mm. it adds too much nitrogen. So the farmers are stockpiling the manure, composting it totally weed free, and it's dairy manure. So there's no, um, you know, you don't have to worry about some of the issues that you have with, with steer manure. They are uh, delivering that. You pay a small fee and they'll deliver it. They call it Moodoo. They call it Superdoo. They call it different things. That is such great stuff and uh, keeps down the weeds. Um, It releases nutrients. Uh, It does not smell. And so that's another great resource I think that is overlooked is, um, I don't know, maybe you in your area, Mike, do they have uh, like horse farms? Still, I don't think there are too many right okay. around here. That's yeah. another source that some people, you know, people that board horses, you know, but just make sure the manure has been piled up mm-hmm. for, you know, nine months or so. Cause that means it gets hot and there's no weed seeds. Right. That's what you want. So, um, and then beauty bark, you can get on the phone and call so many nurseries and they will deliver, you know, nice looking beauty bark. But hey, do not overlook the beauty of stone and rock and gravel. Mm-hmm. Uh, what Maranacas has great ideas. In fact, they'll be at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show uh, with all their beautiful different kinds of, of rocks and designs with rocks. And mm. That's pretty cool. Too. Very nice. Uh, what's the main thing you would like listeners to take away from this discussion? Oh, I want listeners to totally know there's options that are so much enjoyable than a lawn, than maintaining a lawn, than paying to maintain a lawn. And it's okay to have a lawn. I mean, I have a lawn in the backyard. I like looking at the lawn, but just start shrinking the lawn. Only have grass where grass wants to grow very easily. And I want everyone to realize the the great gift of having property that you can grow different kinds of plants. It's just... It's good for the world. It's good for the, um, you know, all of our wildlife. And I mean, it's gardeners that are going to save the world, I always say, because we're going to be the stewards of this. And having some, you know, diversity in our backyards and our front yards is a really good thing. Final question. Marianne, what do you most enjoy about your job? Uh, probably just me, the, the people. I think, you know, I'm so lucky because my husband was a pharmacist and he says, a lot of people work with people who don't want to buy what you're selling. You know, they don't feel good. Mm-hmm. They grumble about what they have to buy, what they have to do. But when it comes to gardening, people look forward to 
learning more about it and, and improving their yards. And so I just love getting to work with people that, um, you know, they're honored and they feel that they could improve the world by improving their immediate environment. And that's very rewarding. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Marianne. And thank all of you for your time today. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, please like and subscribe and follow us on the socials. You can also find helpful information about Cascades Water Conservation Programs at cascadewater.org. Have a great day. And remember, we need water.